Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 15261 in the name of Ivan McKee and recognising the life sciences sector in Scotland. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Ivan McKee to speak to move the motion. Minister, 12 minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Next month marks the second anniversary of the publication of the Life Science Strategy for Scotland. I'm delighted to have life sciences included in my portfolio. Not only is the sector extremely important to trade, to investment and to innovation, it's also a key part of Scotland's economy. And I'm glad to have secured this debate today and the opportunity to update the Parliament on progress in these key areas and more broadly across the sector. The life science sector strategy has been developed by the industry, working in collaboration with academia and government through the industry leadership group Life Sciences Scotland. The aim of the strategy is to grow the sector, to create the environment to enable companies to access new markets and to make sure that Scotland remains a location of choice for business investment and research within the sector. The strategy is clear and focused. Its four strands cover innovation and commercialisation, leveraging our academic excellence and growing the entrepreneurial mindset within the sector, sustainable production, building manufacturing excellence and enabling reshoring internationalisation, driving up inward investment and boosting exports, and the business environment, in particular ensuring the supply of skills and finance to the sector needs to grow and flourish. And the evidence shows that the sector is making, the strategy is making a difference. Latest figures show sector turnover of almost 5.2 billion in 2016, a 39% increase over five years, and well on course at the industry target of 8 billion by 2025. Gross value added for the sector was 2.4 billion in 2016, a 27% increase in a single year. The sector is the largest contributor to Scotland's business research and development investment, with 2017 birds reaching 293 million, almost a quarter of the total for the whole Scottish economy. The sector boasts an R&D spend of over 17,000 pounds per job, 36 times the Scottish average. And the life science sector exports were reported at uh, 1.2 billion in 2016. They form a key part of our plans to ramp up Scotland's international trade through our export plan. The sector now has more than 700 companies employing almost 40,000 people. Many of these are high value jobs with median weekly full time earnings in the sector of £723 in 2017, 32% higher than the Scottish average. And this is a sector with real growth opportunities. Recent data from Deloitte shows that global healthcare spending is projected to increase at an annual rate of 4.1% over the period 2017 to 2021. That's an increase from the previous rate of 1.3% over the period 2012 to 2016. Aging and increasing populations, expansion of developing markets, advances in medical treatments, and rising employment costs will all drive health spending growth. But more than that, the sector has the opportunity to benefit the lives of millions of people through innovations that increase health and literally save lives. Of course, life sciences covers much more than just human health, with Scotland being recognised internationally as a leading player in animal health, particularly in the fields of genetics, genomics, endemic diseases and parasitology. And in Agritech, James Hutton is developing and commercialising new smart energy and LED light systems for the indoor growth of high value crops. Beside an office of Scotland's historical place at the forefront of medical innovation is a matter of record. From the world leading work of Joseph Lister, Alexander Fleming and Professor John McLeod through to Dolly the Sheep, and the bionic hand, there are countless examples of innovations in academic excellence that underpin our excellent life science sector. The research work of our universities continues to lead the sector globally. Dundee University is ranked the world's most influential pharmaceuticals research institute for 26 to 2016, according to State of Innovation Report by Clarivate Analytics. The University of Edinburgh is the only other UK institution in that top 10 list which includes the likes of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the University of California, Berkeley. And Glasgow is home to the new 15.8 million Artificial Intelligence Health Research Centre. The centre will support research not just in Glasgow, but in Aberdeen, St Andrews and Edinburgh to enable joined up academic and commercial technology development. Six of our eight 
innovation centres support the sector, including the Stratified Medicines Innovation Centre at Glasgow University, those covering sensor technology, digital health and biotechnology at Strathclyde, the Aquaculture Innovation Centre at Stirling University and the University of Edinburgh's Data Lab. And between 2009 and 2015, Scotland created 170 life science startups and 60 university spin-outs. Beside the officer, since my appointment, I've had the pleasure of visiting more than a dozen life science businesses across Scotland, large and small, and covering the wide breadth of subsectors within the industry, from high-tech startups in the incubator at Dundee University to established manufacturing businesses in Inverness and those providing truly global clinical trial services from their base in Glasgow. Presiding officer, Brexit is a key concern of many businesses, and this is a subject I shall return to in more detail in my closing marks. But just this morning, I spent time with Ken Sutherland and his team at Cannon Medical here in Edinburgh, and I was hugely impressed with the work they are doing in software development and artificial intelligence. And one of the issues I discussed with Cannon was that of skills. The life science community employs a significant number of people in Scotland, creating high value and highly skilled employment opportunities for school leavers, graduates, and experienced personnel from across Scotland and beyond. That is why the skills agenda is at the heart of our life science strategy, with skills investment plans and leadership masterclasses for the life and chemical sciences sectors. The availability of skills and talent has a huge influence over where businesses choose to locate. Scotland, indeed I shall. Dean Lockhart. Thank the Minister for, for giving way. He mentions about the, the necessary skills for the sector. Does he agree with the Scottish Life Sciences Association that uh, his government's policy of making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK will make it more difficult to recruit the necessary, necessary skills into the sector? Minister. Well, I have to say, in all the businesses I've spoken to in the past six months, and uh, i say more than a dozen life sciences, the issue has not been raised with me. Uh, the issues that concern them, the availability of skills and the damage that hard Brexit is going to do to that on, uh, in this particular sector, and that's something I'll come on to later. And as a member full well knows, across the piece, Scotland's the fairest and the lowest for the vast majority of people tax part of the UK. Scotland's a highly skilled workforce with the highest proportion of tertiary education graduates aged between 25 and 64 anywhere in the EU. We have a fantastic pipeline of highly qualified individuals who are job ready for roles in the sector and we are working hard to keep it that way. That's why we have committed to establishing a national retraining partnership together with unions and business and to publish a future skills action plan. Life science businesses have a key role to play in increasing Scotland's export something that is a huge focus of mine. Our export plan, supported by a £20 million investment over three years, will be published this spring. The plan will identify key sectors and markets to focus our efforts and provide support both here in Scotland and in market for businesses to position themselves to take advantage of international trade opportunities. Attracting foreign direct investment is equally important to the sector. Last September, I visited BioCity and Newhouse to hear from a number of life sciences company, companies who are continuing to expand in Scotland, creating high-value jobs. It is vital that we continue to promote Scottish excellence globally in services, innovation, products and in people. SDI has been successfully delivering in this area for a number of years and we're seeing the benefits of that work through record levels of inward investment projects and jobs. In October, my colleague Mr Mackay launched the Invest in Scotland Capital Investment Portfolio, which includes investable opportunities, including BioQuarter in Edinburgh and the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District in Renfrewshire. Through our innovation and investment hubs and the global network of SDI offices, we're working to deliver compelling messages that pr promote Scotland as a place of choice for investment. And in all six of my international trips, since taking up my role have included a focus on targeting more life science businesses and persuading them to come to Scotland. Investors bring high value jobs and new business opportunities and crucially they develop our supply chains and reinforce our reputation as a fantastic place to invest in. Scotland's NHS is a key partner in the development of our life sciences sector. The opportunity for the NHS to use the sector to bring advanced technology and innovative processes to the table, for example, through the work of CivTech Challenges, or to use the sector to operationalise innovative ideas from clinicians and others in the NHS, as done by Shell and through the Health Improvement Partnerships, benefits both the sector and, importantly, improves patient care. 
with the potential also to reduce costs and waiting times. These are relationships I value highly and work alongside my colleagues, the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister for Health to strengthen and develop, ensuring, of course, at all times to prioritise the needs of patients. President Officer, let me, um, as I draw towards a conclusion, comment on the amendments put forward by the opposition parties. The Government will be accepting the Labour Amendment. We're always keen to work with trade unions. We recognise the value and perspectives they bring to all of our work on the economy. And this extends to our partnership work to grow and develop the life science sector. Creating high value jobs is in everyone's interest. Turning to the Conservative Amendment, I am keen and the industry is keen that the time we have here today is focused on the sector, its strengths and challenges, the work that has been done and the work that we still have to do. Collaborating with our partners in industry, our excellent academic institutions and other stakeholders, including trade unions, to drive the sector forward. The assertion that the Scottish Government will receive an extra £2 billion is unsubstantiated and based on past performance and previous UK Government promises is somewhat detached from the reality. For that reason, we will not be supporting the Conservative amendment. Presiding officer, this is a sector that has gone from strength to strength in recent years and has bold, ambitious and achievable plans for the future. The sector strategy has been instrumental in focusing efforts to deliver what has been achieved so far. We're only two years into the strategy and there has been real improvement in just that short period of time. As co-chair of Life Sciences Scotland, that is encouraging to see. I'm excited for the sector's future and look forward to working with industry and others to further develop its potential. President officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Minister. I now call on Dean Lockhart to speak to move amendment 15261.1. Mr Lockhart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, Scotland has a long and distinguished history in life sciences from, as the Minister mentioned, from Alexander Fleming discovering penicillin through to Sir James Black developing beta blockers. Scotland has led the world in the fields of medicine and biology. Today, Scotland has one of the most dynamic life science sectors in Europe, employing over 37,000 people across 700 organisations. Turnover in the sector exceeds £4 billion, contributing over £2.4 billion of gross value, uh, value to the Scottish economy. Today's debate, I think, is a good opportunity uh, to recognise the efforts of everyone involved in the success of the sector and the collaboration involved. Uh, Minister, do, do you want to intervene? Yeah, please go ahead. You anticipated you poised to pounce. <laughs> Minister. To, just to um, update the stats, the turnover for the sector is now more than £5 billion. Yes, Thank you. Mr Lockhart. It's a, it's, as I mentioned, it's a fast-moving sector, so that's uh, good news. <laughs> One of the key strengths of the sector is its diversity, comprising a wide range of multinationals, SMEs and startups, spanning areas such as human healthcare, pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. But it's important to recognise that it's not just the private sector that is driving progress in this area. Key to the, the success has been the ongoing partnership between industry, universities and charities. And the NHS has played and continues to play a critical role in the research and development and for delivering and pioneering new treatments and global advances in medicine. The critical role played by the NHS will be further strengthened by the announcement this week by the Prime Minister of the UK Government's long-term plan for the NHS, which will result in a £2 billion funding boost for the NHS here in Scotland. And that's highlighted in our amendment today. This extra funding will not only support frontline services, but it can be used to finance significant additional R&D in life sciences to support the future success of the sector. And I must say, I'm slightly disappointed that the SNP will not be uh, supporting our amendment to their motion today and not recognizing the benefits that will come to Scotland as a result of the UK government's long-term plan. Presiding officer, with this background, it's clear that Scotland has a strong foundation for future success in the sector. The Scottish Government's life science strategy is a welcome step in the, the right direction and it identifies a number of opportunities, but I think the reality is that more needs to be done to realise the enormous potential and ambition within the sector. By its own, its own admission, the Scottish Government failed to meet its original target set in 2011 to double the turnover of the life sciences sector uh, to 6.2 billion by 2020. Uh, the timetable for this target, I understand, has been instead, the tar I, I will in a second, the timetable for this target has instead been extended to 2025. I'll give way to the Minister. Minister. 
Uh, I think just to, again to correct the members' numbers, the target originally was set at uh, just uh, the number was just over three billion in 2011 to increase that uh, through the course of that plan to, as the member correctly says, six and a half billion by 2020. The number we're at at the moment is 5.2 billion. If we continue the con uh, seven percent annualised growth rate that we've seen over the last five years, continue that, we shall certainly exceed the target, the original target of 2020, and at almost seven billion by 2020. The target for 2025 is actually eight and a half billion, and at the moment we're on target to exceed that as well. well there you go, Mr. Locker. Well I was done. trying I'm to glad. follow Thank that, you. but there you are. I thank the Minister for that uh, intervention, but I believe the original target set in 2011 will, if, if, is, is uh, for a target for 2020, which is 6.2, and we're still quite a way behind that. But I recognise the progress that has been made and the contribution uh, by everyone in the sector. Let me turn to uh, some policy measures and actions we think the Scottish Government should be taking in addition to the life science strategy. The first is uh, the Scottish Government needs to actively engage in the UK industrial strategy and in particular the UK life sciences sector. Uh, having spoken to a number of companies in the last couple of days, they recognise the, the real opportunities available in the UK life sciences market and are under the UK sector deal. The UK has the largest biotech cluster in the world outside of the US. The UK market is the fastest growing in Europe. It's worth over 70 billion pounds and it employs over 250,000 uh, people across the UK. And we're seeing significant investments coming uh, through under the sector deal, 500 million pounds of UK government support for research and over 1 billion pounds of new industry investment over the last couple of years. Funding under the UK sector deal includes uh, the plan to increase total public sector R&D to 12.5 billion pounds by 2021, and that, for the avoidance of doubt, is a UK-wide investment. An investment of £85 million in the world-leading UK biobank, and the sector deal recently delivered an investment of £13 million in the UK manufacturing centre, the medicines manufacturing centre, based in Renfrewshire. So it's clear there are significant opportunities under the UK uh, sector deal, and that's why we would encourage the Minister and the Scottish Government to do more to ensure that everyone involved in the life science sector here in Scotland can uh, capitalise on those UK sector deal opportunities. The second area where the Scottish Government can take meaningful action is to help uh, the sector, is to reduce the tax gap with the rest of the UK. I mentioned earlier the Scottish Life Sciences Association has written to the First Minister to express their concerns about the policy of making Scotland the highest income tax part of the UK. The letter uh, talks about the impact, the direct and uh, indirect impact on recruitment, which will result from a situation where after-tax remuneration of recruits from outside of Scotland is going to be lower than uh, uh, elsewhere in the UK. And I think with stage one of the budget coming up in the Chamber in the next few weeks, the Minister should take the warnings from those within the sector and reverse the policy of increasing the tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Another area that the industry has expressed concerns about is the growing shortage of science teachers in primary and secondary schools. Uh, we need to ensure children are getting the education they need for a career in life science. And it's clear there is an increasing science skills gap emerging in schools, uh, uh, colleges and universities. Since uh, 20, uh, 2008, the number of secondary school t science teachers has declined by 15% and there are currently record vacancies for those slots. We need to address, address this underinvestment and the science skills gap. Uh, finally, presiding officer, um, in his opening remarks, the minister referred to the impact of uh, Brexit. Uh, we recognise the uh, uh, impact of potential no deal Brexit and so there is one simple thing I think uh, the Minister can do and that's to encourage his colleagues in Westminster to support the Brexit deal which the Prime Minister has negotiated. The, this deal is supported by all, all major business organisations in Scotland for providing the stability and certainty for business uh, by keeping the UK in the customs union until we agree the free trade agreement and that's why in addressing his point uh, with regard to Brexit, I would ask the Minister to encourage his colleagues in Westminster to support, for the, so support the Prime Minister's uh, deal. So, uh, Deputy President Officer, to conclude, we have outlined a series of policy measures that the Scottish Government can take to further advance the life sciences sector in Scotland, all of them within the control of the SNP. And I look forward to the Minister's closing remarks to see 
what of these uh, necessary actions and policy measures he will take to realise the potential and ambitions of this vital sector for Scotland. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. When you take interventions, I will give you extra time because we have a little time in hand. I now call on Richard Leonard to speak to and move Amendment 15261.2. Mr Leonard, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open this debate on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. There's little doubt about the vast economic contribution that the life sciences industry is making to the Scottish economy. Uh, just this morning, Rhoda Grant and I uh, visited the world-renowned Roslyn Institute, a world leader in life sciences research and development. And it reminded me of a number of important lessons. Firstly, that it is and always should be the primary goal of public research and development to solve wider societal and technological problems. That it should be international in outlook. That it must be long-term and not just short term in, his, in its horizons, and that it should never simply be reduced to commercialization and the price of economics alone. At its best, the right combination of good science, the best brains, women as well as men, in these STEM areas, and innovative public investment can pave the way for wider social as well as, as, well as economic benefit. But what was also striking is just how enormous the potential is for continued significant economic and employment growth in life sciences in Scotland. That institutes like the Roslyn are giving a lead in this important scientific revolution of our age. That they are already creating valuable and innovative business spin-offs and so good quality jobs but that also we need to get the design of the commercialization pipeline right, that it cannot be left to chance or to the invisible hand of the market, but that we need a planned approach instead of a purely market-driven approach to economic development, and that we need an industrial strategy led not just by a UK government, but by a Scottish government with vision. If we are to win the job benefits here, and not to see the re-emergence of the all too familiar pattern of research here, development there, and full production and commercial gain overseas. And for Scotland to continue to be able to compete on a global scale within this sector, particularly for small and medium sized enterprises, it's absolutely essential that we have continued access to the expertise, the intelligence, the people and the markets that have fueled that rapid growth in Scotland over the last 20 years. In other words, failure to secure a trade deal with the EU could result in a risk to medicines and clinical trials, which in turn will have a negative impact on investment employment and will put at risk the ability of our universities to conduct pioneering research in Scotland. But it's not just research that's at risk. Also, potentially, public health and safety and the processes and practices which currently under EU law protects consumers. For example, genetically modified food and plants currently need to pass safety checks before they are used in the European Union a point reinforced in a ruling last year by the European Court of Justice on synthetic biology, or GMO 2.0. This is important to consumers, which is why the practice of all these safety checks, authorizations, processes, and labeling must be mirrored and continue post-Brexit. Our amendment to the Scottish Government motion highlights the important role for trade unions, both as part of future work across the life sciences sector, but also as part of a wider industrial strategy. And we must face up to the fact that some of the major corporations within the life science industry in Scotland have at times obstructed their workers simply in the pursuit of the fundamental human right of trade union membership and organization. Best practice in industrial relations should be an absolute prerequisite for companies who wish to be considered for public contracts, any government funding, and that includes 
NHS funding. We've set out in our Scottish Labour Industrial Strategy how we would drive up productivity, which includes investment in science, research and collaboration, in education and skills. We would do that by setting up new strategic sectoral forums covering strategically important sectors, which would include life sciences. Such a forum will bring together private companies, universities, government, trade unions and other stakeholders. Because in the end, it is only by working together that we will improve productivity, target procurement, direct investment, boost competitiveness, drive up skills and deliver apprenticeships and good jobs. We need to inspire the next generation of Scottish scientists, researchers and innovators. That means we need to remove the barriers. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Minister. Um, can uh, Richard Leonard clarify what the difference between the forums he's talking about is and the current industry leadership group? Richard Leonard. Yeah, the difference between the forums that we've set out and the existing groups is that there would be much more involvement from trade unions uh, who currently don't have a big role to play. And frankly, we would like to see a bigger role from the public sector in them. The, uh, the strategy paper, which is a government strategy paper, uh, includes a foreword by the minister, uh, but also by the vice president of uh, Glaxo Klein Beecham. So we would like to see more of a public sector steer on the work of uh, the forums. Um, we also want to see barriers removed to young people, and again, especially, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, to young women and girls to get them more uh, involved in careers uh, in this industry. And so, in summary, um, uh, can I say that we need a strategic public sector intervention because in this sector, above all others, we need to adopt the working assumption that the needs of all must count for more than the profits of the few. There must be a proper balance of interests between mega corporations and democratic accountability. And that we also must put in place a new model for innovation, which puts investment in long-term research and development before any spending boosts to short-term share prices. Because if we do that, this parliament will serve well the people we are here elected to represent. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard. And I now call on Willie Rennie. Mr. Rennie, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Listening to Richard Leonard, do you think he was in favour of remaining in the European Union for all the credit that he was given to the European Union for the progress that we've made in this country? It's disappointing that that is not actually the Labour Party policy. I know there is a growing group of people called Bob in this country, bored of Brexit. But I'm afraid I'm going to talk about Brexit this afternoon, despite the fact that the Minister didn't want to focus on it this afternoon for quite commendable reasons that he wants to focus on the sector. Um, because the life sciences sector will be directly affected by it. This is evident from the sector briefings that we have received this afternoon in the debate. Um, the motions and amendments don't refer to it, but I want to major on it this afternoon. The life sciences sector is deeply worried about what Brexit will do to their sector. Life sciences has been a major success story for Scotland. Others have talked about it quite significantly this afternoon. It is worth rehearsing some of the numbers. The financial value of the sector has risen, as the Minister says, from £4 billion in 2015 to 5.2 billion in 2016, with a target of 8 billion by 2025. It's worth rehearsing some of the distinct advantages that we've got in Scotland with the sector. The patient identification from cradle to grave, the strong collaboration across the NHS, academia, government and industry, globally competitive trial recruitment and start-up times, Biobank and resource, unrivaled in Europe, globally recognised electronic health systems, home to, world, stop, home to the world's top medical schools focusing on translational medicine, the phase one, two and three clinical trials, post-market surveillance, biostatistics, regulatory compliance, data management and study monitoring, the fast performance turnaround times of three weeks for commercial projects and just under two weeks for non-commercial projects. These are quite remarkable and it's no surprise therefore that there, are, there is so much interest in Scotland from this sector and that it is growing so much too. 
And that is why we've got the £56 million UK Innovation Centre in Renfrewshire, which will revolutionise how medicines are manufactured and speed up the process of bringing new drugs to market. The biocluster sites in Scotland include the Edinburgh Bioquarter, the BioCity, the Drug uh, Discovery Unit up in Dundee, the Inverness Campus, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. We've also got innovation centres covering stratified medicine, sensors, digital health, industrial biotechnology and aquaculture. So why on earth are we doing anything to undermine this growing sector with Brexit? Brexit will undermine it, as we've seen from the briefings this afternoon. We've got a global, outward-looking sector that's connected to the rest of the world and to Europe. So why on earth are we pursuing a Brexit process that will undermine the sector? The life science sector relies on access to the best staff across Europe and across the world. It relies on the smooth and easy transfer of life science related supplies and human biological specimens on people and materials. Erecting any barriers between this country and Europe will damage its prospects. The uncertainty alone, as we've already seen, is causing damage. It's causing hesitation in investment. It's causing workers to think about whether they want to come and work in this country. So, of course, we're already working across the world, across the globe, in this sector. But that is in part because we're in the European Union. We're working in partnership. We've got an outward-looking approach. Anything that undermines that will cause that sector to diminish. The best people come to work here, in part because our country is in the European Union. Brexit has put a question mark in their minds about whether this is a location that they will continue to grow and thrive. Take the Beetson in Glasgow. 70% of its research assistants are non-UK citizens. Over 30 nationalities, 30 nationalities work there. Half of the graduate students and 45% of the postdocs are from Europe. None, not one single junior group leader is British. Not one of them is British. It's an international institution proudly housed in Glasgow because we are an outward looking country that is in partnership with the European Union and is not deciding to pull up the drawbridge and do things by ourselves. We are a success because of all that. So why on earth are we putting any doubt in all of those workers at the Beetson? Why are we putting any doubt and all of the workers at all of those centres that I've talked about, up in Inverness, up in Dundee, in the Queen Elizabeth University in Glasgow, the Edinburgh Biocorter, the BioCity, why are we putting doubts in their minds with Brexit? The IQVIA and the Q2 Solutions Briefing is quite blunt. They are Scotland's largest life sciences employer. In the event of a no-deal Brexit, the availability of investigational medicines and equipment used in our globally sponsored clinical trials could be disrupted. UK clinical research in the UK will be at a medium risk, it says. It says it is crucial that both tariff and non-tariff barriers are avoided. Of course, the mutual recognition between the UK and the European Medicines Agency is essential, but that's just one agreement that will be required. We'll need to have a host of agreements right across the board. You look at it, it looks like we're trying to recreate the European Union. Why on earth are we trying to recreate the European Union? Because it's of so much value. Why are we causing all this uncertainty? Why are we causing all this doubt in people's minds? Why on earth are we pursuing this Brexit? Let's support the life sciences sector. Let's reject Brexit. Thank you very much. And I move to the open debate. I have a little time in hand for interventions. I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Gordon Linders. Ms Maguire, please. Presiding officer, with over 700 life sciences organisations employing more than 37,000 people in high quality jobs, Scotland is one of the largest life science clusters in Europe. The importance of the sector to Scotland as a whole is clear and I welcome our SNP government's continued commitment to grow the industry with the most recent programme for government setting out an ambitious package of measures to promote the life sciences sector's research institutions, its international reputation and potential for significant growth with of course the creation of high value jobs that go with that. 
The Fraser of Allender Institute report the economic contribution of the pharmaceutical industry in Scotland states that for every 100 full-time equivalent employees working in the wider pharmaceutical sector, an additional 240 jobs are supported elsewhere in the Scottish economy. The industry is also a key employer in towns and more rural communities outside of major cities. My Cunningham South constituency is home to two well-established companies, Merck and GSK, both of whom contribute to our local and national economy through the spending of wages and salaries, of course, but also through complex supply chains. Merck describes Scotland as a powerhouse for their business and the Irvine site as a key contributor to its Scottish success. The company's Scottish sites, with over 680 employees, supply the global pharmaceutical industry, biotechnology companies, research institutes and academic centres of the world, with tools, chemicals, regents and testing services to make scientific breakthrough possible. The Irvine site has been there since 1976 and manufactures critical components for some of the world's highest profile treatments. These are shipped to vaccine and pharmaceutical companies across the world. There are over 170 highly skilled employees who produce liquid and powder cell culture media and regents used in biomedical research and production globally. The Irvine site has expanded recently. Um, there's been investment in the area. My, my last visit there was um, to the Life Sciences Cell Culture Media Plant, and I was accompanied by students from Irvine Royal Academy and staff from across Merck's Scottish sites. We were there to see the Performance Materials Smart House. Now, the Smart House is a 24 square meter pod featuring cutting edge new technologies that have been created by the Merck Life Sciences experts. It included everything from organic solar cells on the outside windows, which generate electricity, intelligent lighting systems made from LED products, which auto alter automatically when natural light changes, and a television so thin that it can be curved without breaking. It was enormous and many of us were coveting it as it would have been ideal for watching the football on with friends round. <coughs> Um, Merck say that the smart house was created to help everyone understand how the life sciences industry will change the way we live in the coming decades. For me though, the real value was in seeing how it could engage with people and particularly the young people who were with me around science and technology. It's important that young men and women know that there are challenging, exciting and interesting opportunities for them for work in our local community and that there are different routes into these jobs, university, college, and modern apprenticeships. Another significant employer in my constituency is GSK, with their two Scottish sites in Irvine and Montrose, they employ more than 1,000 people and are critical to the medicine supply chain. Investment in our young people is also something that they state as a priority. And this, they <coughs> um, illustrate this through their apprenticeships, STEM ambassador work with local schools, and the sponsorship of body works at the Glasgow Science Centre. In August, I took part in Apprentice for the Day and had the chance to spend time at the plant in Irvine with some of the young people. During my visit, I had the pleasure to meet Shannon, who had just started to train as an apprentice, and Matthew had recently completed his training and now works full-time for the firm. Shannon noted that she'd always wanted to do something practical on leaving school and that her apprenticeship was providing her with the perfect opportunity to learn a range of skills within the trade. And Matthew added that the chance to experience different roles in the organisation through his apprenticeship had helped to make him work ready on completion. More recently, I was honoured to present GSK Apprentice of the Year Award. The Irvine site has apprentices across four key disciplines, engineering, manufacturing, EHS advisor and supply chain. The overall winner was Rachel McGivern, an engineering apprentice who was word, awarded first place by her peers and leaders for her proactive approach, impressive analytical and practical skills, completing an SVQ ahead of schedule with excellent grades and contributing positively to the site as a whole. Rachel undoubtedly has a great career ahead of her in engineering. In closing, presiding officer, I would just say that the life sciences sector is important for the Ayrshire economy. There are opportunities there for our young people. It's important to Scotland's economy. And I welcome the Scottish Government's continued investment in this important sector. Look forward to continued success for Scotland as a powerhouse for life sciences. Thank you very much. I call Gordon Lindhurst. We followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Lindhurst, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
The life sciences sector is an area in which the reputation of Scotland and the UK spans the globe. Uh, that is much down to the famous sheep Dolly, cloned at the University of Edinburgh's Roslyn Institute, of course. 20 years on, and the Lothian region I represent goes from strength to strength in the field of life sciences, benefiting, amongst other initiatives, from the UK and Scottish governments working together on the Edinburgh and South East City region deal. Bringing investment to projects such as the Roslyn Institute to bring together life scientists, clinicians, and data scientists to develop innovative and financially sustainable models of health and social care that improves lives. And it is not just our universities which make the Lothian region such an important place for this sector. I met earlier today with the director of ICFIA, Scotland's biggest life sciences employer. They are a global data human sciences company with a laboratory in Livingston that processes 4 million biological samples from clinical trials across the world each year. Investment at that laboratory will also allow pharmaceutical and biotech companies from around the world to understand better how genes affect people's health and risk of disease so that personalized medicines can be created. The company decided to base some operations in Livingston because of the rich life sciences ecosystem that exists here. Indeed, the UK health and life sciences sector, as we have heard, is the fastest growing in Europe. And it is important that governments work together across the UK to maintain and grow that reputation, as well as attracting inward investment from across the world. Scotland can benefit from initiatives such as the life sciences sector deals as part of the industrial strategy, which are fundamental to supporting the sector, boosting R&D funding to 12.5 billion by 2021 and 2022, as well as funding from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund and Scottish Enterprise that will be used for one of the new UK medicines manufacturing innovation centres to be based in Renfrewshire, I'll take the Minister's intervention. Ivan McKee. Uh, thanks for taking the intervention. Um, just to check if uh, Gordon Lintos, the business you visited today, is the same business that produced this document highlighting in graphic detail the extreme damage that Brexit is going to do to the sector. Gordon Lintos. Um, it, is, it is the same um, business, but of course the, uh, what is said in that document is quite uh, nuanced and fairly carefully worded. And I think, like other businesses and other um, people involved in the sector, they would be surprised that the Minister and the Scottish Government would not support the amendment put forward by the member, Dean Lockhart, encouraging the Scottish Government and the UK Government to look towards a positive uh, working uh, relationship together. Now, turning back to what I was talking about, um, that centre will support small and multinational companies to manufacture medicines for a global market said to be worth around £98 billion. Pounds. And of course, uh, the interesting point uh, raised by the Minister, one, one should bear in mind that we uh, actually export more in terms of uh, products provided to the EU than the EU does to us. So it's in the interest of both the European Union and the United Kingdom to come to uh, agreements in terms of looking to the future and going forward post-Brexit and that's really what we on these benches want to do. We want to work towards a positive future. Now fundamental to the sector and to the stakeholders involved in it is of course their relationship with the NHS and the opportunities that can be provided for improving care pathways and patient services as a result. The UK and government has invested in the long-term future of the NHS with consequent benefits for the Scottish Government's budget, and that is a welcome step that will be of benefit to the life sciences sector and the health of our nation. And as I've said, building and maintaining those relationships is not just important within the domestic market, but internationally too. As the life sciences strategy for Scotland highlights, with already such a good international reputation as its foundation, Scottish companies and organisations can utilise the networks they already have. And these are worldwide. They're not simply restricted to that small part of the world that we, we are in, in the EU. 
and organizations they can utilize the networks they already have to, to further develop their international mindset. Government has a role, of course, to play here, helping and encouraging the sector to think global, as well as promoting the life sciences sector in Scotland as somewhere to invest through the likes of Scottish Development International. But as we reach out to other parts of the world, we must ensure that the investment opportunities available to us already are being used to their fullest extent. And that's something the Economy Committee found is not uh, always being the case. The specific uh, item I would refer to is the issue of the investment of up to 10 million pounds from Scottish Enterprise within a wider 200 billion pound package. And the committee found that only 500,000 pounds of that money had been spent by Scottish Enterprise by the end of October 2018. Now, the Scottish Investment Bank Director Kerry Sharp noted recently that the life sciences sector is an excellent fit for the program in an attempt to encourage businesses to come forward. While it is disappointing that such efforts have been slow to get going, I hope that the life sciences sector can now fully benefit from these investment opportunities, and I would hope that the Minister would equally encourage them to do so. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, the life sciences sector in Scotland is one we can be proud of, but there's much more that we can do. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As convener of the Cross Party Group on Life Sciences, I'm pleased to participate in this afternoon's debate and hearten to hear about the progress already made towards meeting the ambitious targets sent, set out in the 2017 Life Sciences Strategy for Scotland 2025 vision to build on the existing strength as vital and highly productive sector of our economy. The life sciences sector has not been immune to the impact of Brexit and the process has put both access to medicines and workforce planning at risk. It's therefore more essential than ever that we continue this government's proactive approach to growth. Scotland has a long and illustrious history of invention, discovery and innovation in the field of medicine and today's modern life sciences sector reflects that tradition. The excellent work of the Life Sciences Scotland Industry Leadership Group, which has played a crucial role in strengthening collaboration between industry, academia and the public sector, has been supported by the reconvening of the Cross Party Group on Life Sciences. The CPG has, since November 2017, taken a proactive role in creating a forum from the for the sector to share its ambitions with the Parliament and foster better working relationships with colleagues across the sector. I thank both Ivan McKee and his ministerial predecessor Paul Wheelhouse for attending and supporting the group since its inception and also members who have participated in the group such as uh, Graham Simpson and Tom Mason. In a little over a year we've been successful in achieving our aim of identifying and discussing policy areas of particular relevance to Scottish life sciences, particularly those which support the delivery of the 2017 strategy. A specific focus has been looking at how to ensure Scotland's workforce has a skill set required to deliver this strategy and there has been much discussion on how to positively address the challenge of bringing more women into the life sciences sector. The impact of these efforts has been tangible. Last March as a direct result of concerns raised during CPG discussions that not enough is being done to showcase Scotland as a destination for global pharmaceutical company investors, the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry the Medicines Trade Body arranged a series of three international webinars. These looked at Scotland's joined up network of life science departments and our universities, opportunities to test ideas in medicines manufacturing through the forthcoming Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre, which is currently under development in Renfrewshire, and the unique data opportunities for Scotland when looking at outcomes for patients from different treatments and clinical pathways. This has raised Scotland's profile as a destination for investment, supporting the attract element of the strategy's anchor build and attract mission outlined in the strategy. Of course, a strategy can only be effective if it takes a holistic and well-rounded view, and that has been reflected in the breadth of discussions which have taken place at meetings of the cross-party group. Topics have ranged from collaborations in life sciences, to the economic impact of the sector, to women in STEM, to waste, to the single national formulary, to diagnostics and beyond. The most recent meeting of the group focused on data because, as the strategy highlights, Scotland has an invaluable resource for the data-driven approach to healthcare of the future, with all patients in NHS Scotland having a unique identifier and electronic health record. The publication of Scotland's digital health and care strategy in April 2018 and the more recent report from the Data Scoping Task Force were both largely welcomed, in particular the aims of capturing medicines used for patients in all clinical settings and including medicines indications in all prescribing systems. As convener, I would let the government know of the desire to see commitments in the delivery of this strategy to joining up data silos 
and acknowledge the link between income to the NHS from properly governed access to anonymised cohort level data and the wider Scottish economy. The group is also seeking an update on the government's response to the report of the Data Scoping Task Force that in September called on the NHS in Scotland to take forward the Montgomery recommendations uh, by on medicines by capturing medicines used for patients in all clinical settings, creating a national laboratory data resource, improving recording of patient outcomes and creating a Scottish Medicines Intelligence Unit, which perhaps the Cabinet Secretary touched on in closing. Uh, as we approach the two-year uh, anniversary of the publication of the Life Sciences Strategy, there is much to celebrate. Sector turnover has already increased uh, from £4 billion in 2015 to £5.2 billion in 2000, uh, uh, and we are on track to meet our target to double sectoral turnover to £8.5 billion by 2025. This is good news for the Scottish economy as the sector directly supports over 5,130 jobs and every 100 of these jobs supports an additional 240 elsewhere in our economy, as Ruth Maguire pointed out. In addition, the jobs created by this growth sector tend to be high value, with the median weekly full-time earnings standing at £723 in 2017, up 6.2% on the year before, which was the largest increase in earnings among all the growth sectors and which compares favourably with the Scottish average wage. Not only has this government been proactive in fostering the right business environment for the life sciences sector to thrive, it has also directly supported innovative and growing companies through its enterprise agencies. Just this week, Glasgow-based Collagen Solutions was awarded a grant of £1.54 million, which will cover more than a third of collagen's expected R&D costs over the next four years. Supporting businesses like Collagen Solutions, a leader in the development and manufacturing of biomaterials and regenerative medicines for the enhancement and extension of human life, is key to fulfilling the targets laid out in our ambitious strategy. If members wish to engage with leaders of growing life sciences companies to further discuss the, this Parliament's role in realising the sector's potential, I would like to extend an invitation to attend the event I will host on Wednesday the 30th of January, jointly involving Scottish Enterprise and the Life and Chemical Sciences Industry Leadership Group. Presiding officer, I'm confident that by continuing its collaboration with industry, academia and the NHS, this government will overcome sectoral challenges and the uncertainty of Brexit to develop a life sciences sector that is sustainable, innovative and competitive. <laughs> Ian Gray, followed by Shona Robson. Hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think we all agree uh, on the importance of life sciences uh, to Scotland, its historical importance, and we've heard of uh, many examples of that, from James Black to Dolly the Sheep and, uh, uh, of course, Alexander Fleming and the invention of penicillin, although Mr Lockhart missed a trick, I think, in not pointing out that he did have to go to St Mary's and Paddington to work there, which was where he, he did discover uh, penicillin. We've also uh, heard, I think, quite correctly about the, the potential that this sector has. Uh, the, the numbers demonstrate that. The, the minister uh, has uh, given us the correct number of £5.2 billion, pounds, I think, turnover now uh, in the life science sector. Some 40,000 people uh, employed in as many as 800 uh, different uh, organisations and enterprises. So that is very significant. Indeed, uh, it's particularly significant for myself as the MSP for uh, East Lothian because the uh, chief economist's uh, briefing on the life of the Scottish Government's chief economist, uh, chief economic advisor's uh, briefing on the, the Life Science Centre uh, points out that East Lothian has the greatest density of employment in the life science sector of any local authority uh, area in Scotland, some 3.2% of total employment uh, in this uh, sector, so I have a particular uh, local interest in this. But look, uh, we should not fool ourselves. The competition uh, in growing this industry is huge. I remember uh, as many as 17 years ago when I was Enterprise Minister uh, on a visit to Sweden going to uh, Uppsala uh, and finding there uh, a university, an ancient university, 15th century university, the oldest uh, in Scandinavia, uh, with a strong history also in the life sciences. Carl Linnaeus, for example, uh, was uh, a professor there uh, when he did uh, his work. But what took me aback was finding that in Uppsala, the whole city seemed to be not much more than an extension of the university uh, and its attempt to build and grow a life science cluster. 
uh, which included its own uh, internationally re renowned commercialization uh, model. Uh, and it was clear to me then uh, that there are many places in the world who are competing for the laurels in life sciences, which we hope uh, to achieve here uh, in Scotland. So this is not something which is going to happen by accident, as happened to Alexander Fleming when he discovered uh, penicillin. It is something that will require a concerted effort. And so the strategy is both necessary and welcome, as is the leadership of the industry leadership uh, group. Uh, but our effort, uh, uh, I think, has to be even stronger, even more national, uh, if we are to achieve that leading role internationally uh, which, we, uh, which we crave. Uh, not so long ago at a life science sector uh, conference, uh, Pete Downs, the recently retired uh, principal of Dundee University, of course a key uh, player in academia and life sciences, said this, uh, one third of business enterprise research and development spending in Scotland is in life sciences, but the biggest threat to its continuing growth is parochialism driven by internal competition for limited resources. To remain competitive, the sector must operate as a Scotland-wide cluster with the confidence to build relationships nationally. And indeed, uh, Dave Tudor, who is the co-chair of that uh, industry leadership group in the same conference, gave the current level of collaboration across the Scottish life science community only five marks out of ten. And so Richard Leonard is right to argue for a more planned and strategic approach, broadening the strategic uh, leadership of our approach to life sciences in order to achieve the growth that we all want to see. That means having the right investment pipeline. The minister talked about touch bionics. Back in those uh, uh, days w uh, when I was enterprise minister, uh, I was the, the minister who awarded touch bionics a smart fun funding uh, award way back in 2002, and they've gone from strength to strength. But they are, of course, now owned by USER, uh, an Icelandic company, which says to me that perhaps the pipeline for supporting companies as they grow may need some work. It also means having the right people at every level and at every discipline. Key skills in the life science sector as it grows are cutting edge lab techniques and data handling and artificial intelligence. Both of those have been mentioned. Uh, in speeches today. We have to be sure that we have uh, the people with those skills coming through in order to see this sector grow. And that means uh, going right back into our schools and ensuring that enough young people are pursuing uh, uh, um, studies and then careers in STEM. Uh, and we have real problems there. We have not just a fall in the number of science teachers, but also science technicians so necessary for the practical science which leads to those lab techniques. And in recent years, a 25% drop we've seen <coughs> in computer science teachers, exactly the teachers we need to be uh, teaching those young people uh, for the sectors of um, big data and artificial intelligence. But, presiding officer, just to finish, if we are to uh, pull Scotland together around a, a national goal or challenge to to build this sector and to be a, a world leading nation in life sciences. I would argue too that perhaps we should think about a, a different kind of focus, something which seizes the imagination rather more than the minister's 7% annualized growth uh, 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 for the, uh, the strategy. We should be looking at something like MS, a disease in which Scotland has a particular problem and trying to commit ourselves over a reasonable period of time to support those who are finding a cure for that disease or MND, a, a, another disease in which Scotland has some very significant uh, research taking place. Let's try and ensure that the life science sector doesn't just grow but seizes the imagination and mobilise not just those involved in the sector but the whole of Scotland so that we look forward to innovations, the equivalent of penicillin or dolly the sheep, rather than always just looking back and being pleased about what we've done in the past. Shona Robson, followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. As we've heard already in this debate, Scotland has seen the highest number of life science startups per capita in the UK and the sector 
Uh, it's estimated to employ in Scotland just under 40,000 people and it accounts for 55% of total university funding. So there's a lot to celebrate. Investment in research and development shows it is a key growth industry and has been identified by the Scottish Government quite rightly as part of their economic strategy in recognition of its high growth potential and capacity to boost productivity. Dundee is, of course, one of the leading locations for life sciences with around 20% of Scotland's life science companies based in and around the city. Employment in life science companies rose from 700 to 900 between 2009 and 2017 in Dundee City, uh, an increase of 28.6% compared to an increase at Scottish level for the same period of 22.3%. Companies already based in the city are expanding their existing operations, which will have a positive knock-on effect for employment in the city for other businesses and industry. For example, the continued growth in Dundee and life sciences and in addition to the opening of the VNA, the city has seen a resurgence in the hospitality industry with a wide variety of uh, hospitality outlets opening. The city offers a wide range of expertise from all over the world, over 60 countries in fact, with international academics and leading life science companies working closely, turning research into drug discoveries and environmental biotechnology into commercial enterprises, advancing therapies and making precision, precision medicines targeted to the individual patient. There are currently around 20 core life science enterprises, similar, similar number of supporting organisations, and of course, the internationally renowned University of Dundee, University of Aberdeen, and close by the James Hutton Institute. The total turnover of life science enterprises in Dundee City rose from £62.7 million in 2008 to £94.6 million in 2017, an increase of 51% compared to a, a Scottish level increase of 15% 15 over the same period. The gross value added or the, the measure of the value of goods and services provided for life science enterprise in Dundee rose from 28.4 million in 2008 to 51.3 million in 2016, representing an increase of 81%. However, the employment figures from the life science enterprise do not include the large input from institutions, including the universities of Dundee, Aberdeen, or the James Hutton Institute, which of course employ a great number of scientists in the city. It's estimated that the academic and support staff and research student numbers at the University of Dundee alone has increased by an average of 5% each year since 2001. And the university has confirmed that they have currently have 685 substantive staff. One of their leading professors of life sciences, Professor Mike Ferguson, received a knighthood in the New Year's honours list. And of course, Professor Ferguson is one of the UK's most eminent life scientists and helped build the drug discovery unit in the University School of Life Sciences, which has attracted over £75 million of investment. As the Minister said earlier, the University of Dundee itself has world-class modern laboratory and technological facilities and according to the QS World University rankings in biological sciences, Dundee was placed in the top five in the UK and eighth in Europe in 2017. The State of Innovation report by Clarvey Analytics ranked Dundee as the most influential scientific research institution in the world for pharmaceuticals for the period 2006 to 2016. Dundee's continued success as one of the key locations in the life science industry is the close relationship between the city's universities, private companies and NHS Tayside. One example of the working relationship is of course the establishment of the academic health science partnership in Tayside between NHS Tayside and the University of Dundee and it acts as a single point of contact for collaborations, strategic partnerships and to identify, support and develop new relationships, facilitate knowledge exchange and opportunities with both industry and major research funders. However, it's vital that in order to maintain Dundee's position as one of the leading life science hubs, ensuring highly skilled, highly high-waged employment into the city is, of course, continued investment. And I'm delighted that as part of the Tay Cities deal, 
£25 million of investment to grow the Tayside Biomedical Cluster was announced late last year. This investment will help to maintain the continued success of Dundee uh, and the surrounding areas as an attractive world leading centre of excellence and a, and, uh, a, a, great, a sought after biomedical location in the UK, creating jobs and boosting the local economy. However, with less than two months remaining, the industry remains unclear exactly how Brexit will affect legal and regulatory requirements for the life science industry in the UK and Europe, and are expressing huge concerns about this uncertainty. Dundee has proven itself as a leading hub for life sciences, but with deep concerns from researchers and industry leaders as to how Brexit will affect research collaborations, development and the ability of companies in the UK to continue working with their continental partners, the UK government urgently needs to provide that much needed clarity to the life science sector. For Dundee's sake and Scotland's sake, that needs to happen now. Bill Bowman, followed by Maureen Watt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this Scottish Government debate recognising the life sciences sector in Scotland. The life sciences sector can be defined as including human health, biology and biotechnology and animal health. Scotland's life sciences community is one of the largest in Europe. Scotland is home to over 700 companies specialising in life sciences and is a global centre of research and development in key sectors including digital healthcare, animal bioscience, regenerative medicine, industrial biotechnology, medical technology and pharmaceutical science. Scotland's formidable legacy in life sciences includes, as we have already heard, Sir Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin in the location mentioned by Ian Gray, Ian Donald's utilisation of ultrasound for obstetrics, and the Roslyn Institute's cloning of Dolly the sheep, the world's first cloned mammal from an adult sheep cell. The latest sector figures that I had show the sector employs over 37,000 people across some 700 organisations, which add about 2.4 billion to the Scottish economy. Scotland is already a leading global life sciences cluster, and in the past few years, Scotland has seen many positive developments. Scotland also has the highest number of life science startups per capita in the UK, while life sciences account for about 55% of total Scottish university research funding. We also have the largest concentration of animal health and aquaculture researchers in Europe. In the UK, Scotland is second only to London in terms of life sciences companies receiving venture finance. The new 2017 Life Sciences Strategy for Scotland, 2025 vision, aims to grow the industrial turnover of life sciences sector to about 8 billion, while also making Scotland the location of choice for the life sciences community. The strategy themes of this vision are innovation and commercialization, sustainable production, internationalization, and business environment. Life sciences is a key sector to the Scottish economy, and we are one of the largest and fastest growing life sciences communities in Europe. The, sec the sector is particularly important to the region I represent, the northeast of Scotland, as it accounts for a large part of the northeast Scotland's economy with more than 2,500 people employed within its companies and research base. The region accounts for more than one-fifth of employment in Scottish life sciences, research and development, and Aberdeen has one of the highest concentrations of life scientists, of life scientists in the UK outside of Cambridge. For example, Aberdeen's health campus is Europe's largest integrated medical research and teaching location and provides a collaborative environment for clinical, commercial and academic researchers. There are numerous examples of the Northeast and in particular Dundee being leading areas in life sciences. A key regulator of cell growth and survival called PKB, protein kinase B, is the focus of numerous anti-cancer drug clinical trials. The role of this protein and how it works was uncovered by researchers at Dundee University and has stimulated pharmaceutical companies to undertake drug development campaigns focused on PKB as a target molecule. Moreover, this research led several life sciences companies to generate research tools to accelerate academic and industrial and in industry research in this area. 
Another success in the life sciences sector orig originating from Dundee University was the pioneer automated drug design methodologies developed by researchers at the university, which led to the spin out of Ex Scientia Limited, a leading British drugs design company in 2012. The company provides technologies to enhance the efficacy and efficiency of drug discovery for the pharmaceutical industry using artificial intelligence. As the life science sector continues to grow, the role of leadership within, its, within it has come increasingly to the fore. Research has isolated five critical leadership areas which they believe will be the battleground of the corporate life science future. One of these adaptive mindset can be shown through the University of Dundee's collaboration with the Boehringer Ingelheim um, organization, a global research-driven pharmaceutical company to provide free access of protact compound used to fight disease cells on public markets. I believe that the Scottish Government recognises the important role that life sciences sector plays in improving Scotland's economic performance and its potential for growth. However, there is more that can be done. The only way to grow the life science industry in Scotland is to create business-friendly environment that will attract both talent and inward investment. I would encourage closer, closer ties between the bioscience industry and Scotland's universities to provide the necessary skills base and business and science for the sector to continue to prosper, duly supported by the Scottish Government. Thank you. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Maureen Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'm too I'm pleased to be taking part in this to debate today on such an important part of the Scottish uh, economy. I recall as a, government minister, as a government minister in 2007 that there was much debate about how Scottish enterprise was going to concentrate its efforts on particular sectors of the economy to help growth in the economy overall. And there was some criticism of that, but I think we have seen the benefits despite the severe impacts of the banking crisis, the UK now in its second decade of austerity, an economic choice by this Westminster government, and more recently, the next choice of this shambolic Westminster government of Brexit. Brexit. The choices made back then were by this Scottish government correct. It is to this SNP government's credit that the Scottish economy is performing so well in the face of such adverse events. We should never forget the significance of this since I've been alarmed long enough to remember that when there have been recessions in the past, Scotland has ended up being fairly, being very badly hit. As it used to say, when England gets a cold, Scotland gets the flu. <coughs> so those opponents of devolution and further devolution of powers would be well to remember that. In amongst all these ex external economic shocks to the Scottish economy, there has also been the most recent downturn in the oil and gas industry, which has probably been longer and deeper than any previous ones. And this has led to leaders in the northeast across business, local councils, higher and further education and the health sectors come together to see what can be done to encourage growth in other sectors such as food and drink and life sciences. An opportunity North East was set up. The North East has always had a very big footprint in the life sciences sector through the Rowett Institute and the James Hutton Institute, which used to be the Macaulay. And th their importance in many fields is well document documented. In order to build on this, on the 21st of November last year, the Biotherapeutics Hub for Innovation was launched in Aberdeen, specifically to drive health innovation and life sciences company growth. This is a £40 million project set to deliver an innovation hub to double the number of life sciences companies in the northeast of Scotland and support the national ambitions of the sector to collaborate, innovate, and commercialise the next generation of therapies and healthcare solutions. This hub will, have, will be a focal point for the sector's ambition of growth and £20 million of capital funding is already secured through the Aberdeen City deal. 
Opportunity North East itself has committed an additional 3.6 million over seven years to operate the hub and deliver this bespoke support activity that is designed to create one of the most dynamic environments and to create grow, and grow life sciences businesses. It will hopefully Brexit permitting be a catalyst for international collaboration and investment. It will be located on the Forrester Hill Health Campus, a, a 69,000 square foot new build facility, which will include accommodation for spin-outs, start-ups and established businesses, collaboration space and shared facilities for events, small conferences and networking. Sector-specific support programmes in the hub will include incubation, accelerating, acceleration, mentoring, commercialisation and growth planning. Of course, the Forrester Hill campus is already one of, as Bill Bowman said, Europe's largest integrated clinical research, teaching and commercial health sites. And this project, with a delivery date of 2020, will only add to its importance and influence um, of that campus and making sure that the targets that the Minister has already mentioned are met. And I'm grateful to Sir Ian Wood, Chair of Opportunity North East, for his role in this, and also to Professor Stegen, Stephen Logan as Chair of the One, of One Life Sciences Sector Board, who has driven this. He has, has, of course, just completed his term as Chair of NHS Grampian recently, and we should thank him for all he did in that role. In fact, you and I are very grateful for what he did in that role. But of the hub, he says it will realise the opportunity to collaborate and innovate, to bring forward the next generation of medical therapies and products. And our target is to double the size of the company base by 2027. This is a transformational project of national significance that supports the regional economic role of diversification and will contribute to the national ambitions of life sciences as a driver of health and wealth. His words, not mine. The Principal and Vice-Chancellor of Aberdeen University, um, Professor Boyne, in welcoming the launch of the hub said, bringing academics, clinicians and industry together onto one site on the Forrester Hill Health Campus uh, is good news for patients and, to, and it will speed up the, tr the transition of research or the translation of research from bench to bedside and improve the diagnosis, management and treatment of disease. Of course, Aberdeen University already has an excellent track record of producing pi pioneering spin-outs tackling serious health con concerns that include antibiotic resistance, autoimmune disease and gut health and Alzheimer's disease. Indeed, in December, the Rowett announced a new Aberdeen-led study to look at the gut health of people with Alzheimer's to see if diet can play a role in managing the behavioral and psychological systems of the disease. There is increasing evidence that the gut Microbiotica is a key, have a key link between specific nutrients and brain function. This study will recruit participants from local care homes, and this, if as successful, this study could act as the first step towards establishing a link between diet and behaviour and possibly lead to future research, looking at teasing out the co complex relationship between diet, gut, microbiotica and challenging behaviour in Alzheimer's disease. As the Minister said, with an ageing population, this is precisely what our life sciences sector can be doing to grow. And while I was enjoying the first part of Ian Gray's speech, he cannot be, help being a glass half-empty half guy. At the last members' debate on MND research, Kezia Dugdale was uh, praising the research of MND in Scotland and she said, if I can remember correctly, that if a cure... Uh, just can like, can, just I, like can I excuse me. both of you because we're way over time here, just, uh, so if I you just, could yeah, come to a okay, conclusion. Can I just, well, to, 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 um, for Ian Gray's benefit, she said that if a cure was to be found, it would be either in Scotland, Australia or Israel. So, presiding officer, I think this has been a very useful debate in highlighting what is going on in Scotland's life sciences sector. Thank you. 
Okay, we now move to the closing speeches, and I'm glad to see that everyone's back in the chamber, courtesy of Mrs. Watt being allowed to talk on for a while. <laughs> and I call Rhoda Grant for around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think this debate highlights the potential of the life sciences sector. Scotland is a world leader, and as Richard Leonard said, we visited the Roslyn Institute this morning, and they're world leaders in agriculture, aquaculture, and animal health. And not only are they world leaders in this, but they also spend time inspiring young people by encour and encouraging businesses to grow around their area of expertise. Ian Gray spoke about the contribution life sciences make to the Scottish economy, 5.2 billion pounds and 40,000 people employed. Imagine with the right strategy, we could grow that, bringing research and development to market by Scottish companies, something we did need to do more to encourage and to create the conditions for this to happen. It won't happen by accident. We need a strategy to do that. To grow the sector, we need to start by inspiring a new generation of scientists, removing the barriers that hold them back. Ruth McGuire talked about having different routes into the sector from college as well as from schools. And we need to encourage more girls into STEM subjects as well. And some years ago, I first visited the Roslyn Institute when they were being awarded the Athena Swan Award, recognising their commitment to women's career development and something I think that came across very strongly again this morning. But we also saw this morning their commitment to young people. They had well-equipped labs for schools to come in, um, not only Scottish schools, but indeed um, schools throughout um, Europe and the rest of the world, where in the interest of young people in STEM subjects. And Dean Lockhart and Ian Gray also mentioned one of the issues with regard to encouraging young people into STEM subjects, and that was the lack of science teachers or teachers within the STEM subjects. You can't have uh, young people enthused if there are not the teachers in place to do that. We need uh, science teachers, we need lab te technicians, and we also need computer science teachers, things that were mentioned in the debate if we are to encourage young people to get involved. We also need a strategy, and Richard Leonard said in his speech that Scottish Labour would set up strategic sec sectoral forums covering uh, strategically important sectors, and this of course would include life sciences. And that would bring together employers, government, the public sector, trade unions, and indeed other stakeholders. And they could work together to improve the productivity within the area, making sure that we invest, we're competitive, and we have the skills to deliver the industry. And that would also feed into an industrial strategy that recognises the worth um, of life sciences to the Scottish economy and brings those developments to market, keeping that benefit with, uh, within Scotland. Ian Gray talked about collaboration and that not working properly within Scotland. So I think that would be a job for those strategic uh, sec se sectoral forums. Or indeed, Life Sciences Scotland, surely they have a role in bringing together what is good in Scotland and making sure they work together. Our motion talks, our amendment to the motion talks about trade union involvement. And the people who staff these life science industries and businesses need to be involved in driving that forward because they have the knowledge to do that. Richard Leonard made the point that some of those businesses don't have a good record in trade union recognition, and that's something that we need to change. And we need to make sure that public funding, um, both for research and development, but indeed public funding for contracts, needs to address this. We need to drive up standards and trade union involvement using um, those, those tools that are at our disposal. Jonah Robson spoke about NHS Tayside and their work with Dundee University. And if I could just mention one part of this, um, a constituent of mine has been campaigning for magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound, something that both those organisations are working together to try and bring to Scotland. 
Um, I have been in contact with the Scottish Government and I hope the Minister maybe looks at this again because they seem unable to help and I think this would be a huge step forward for Scotland because the only place this is available at the moment is in London and I think it's important that we bring this technology to Scotland. Um, yes, we have to work with other parts of the UK, um, as Stephen Lockhart said, and it's clear that funding and collaboration UK-wide is very important in the sector, but we also have to make sure that we don't um, fall behind as well. We need to continue to work together to be a world leader in life sciences, and indeed, um, when we spoke with the Roslyn Institute this, main, this morning, they talked about a lot of their funding coming from the, the Biotechnical and Biological Science Research Council, which is a UK-wide organisation, and they work very closely with them. And indeed, they work very closely with other institutes throughout the UK, and they see that partnership as incredibly important to their future. Um, Ian Gray talked about um, research and investment and how we should be looking for the cures for things like MS and MND and I sincerely hope that that is something we will continue to aspire to do. Um, in closing, presiding officer, um, life sciences is an important part of our economy and we need to make sure we develop the sector. We need um, also to make sure that we capitalise on the research and development and make sure that Scottish companies are at the forefront of bringing this innovation to market. If we had an industrial strategy and if the Scottish Government were to develop such a strategy, surely life sciences would be at the very heart of that, allowing those opportunities and that growth to happen within our country, within our industry. Paul Graham Simpson for around seven minutes, please. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's, um, it has been an interesting debate, this. Um, the life sciences sector is important to Scotland uh, and the rest of the UK, and that's been demonstrated this afternoon. Um, so I want to close for the Conservatives by saying a bit about my, my own interests in the sector, highlighting some of the contributions in the debate, and finally asking some questions of the government. The life sciences sector is an important contributor to Scotland's economy, as we've heard. It provides more than 37,000 jobs across more than 700 life sciences organisations. That sentence comes from the government's own life sciences strategy, and it's good that there is one. My own interest in the sector is personal. Uh, one of my daughters gained a master's degree in biochemistry at Glasgow and is now doing a PhD at Cambridge, specifically a project to do with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and don't intervene on me here because that's as much as I know or understand about it. Uh, and despite my scientific shortcomings, I'm somehow the vice convener of Parliament's uh, CPG on life sciences. Uh, we've met through that group um, some fascinating people doing amazing work, and I've seen firsthand uh, the impact the sector has on our job market and economy. We have a lot to be proud of in our life sciences sector. In my region, in central Scotland, we have the Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre in East Kilbride. You'll know it well, presiding officer, uh, which used to house a nuclear reactor. Uh, there's some great work going on there in conjunction with our higher education sector, but it's largely unsung, not known about. And there's the hub of research and innovation at BioCity in North Lanarkshire, funded through City Deal. Uh, one of the standout small companies based there is Kuntec, and I find this company uh, really exciting. Uh, through their research, passion, and dedication to creating food packaging from marine life byproducts, shells, um, I hope that we will see their compostable food packaging in supermarkets soon. Uh, not only could this product reduce plastic waste, but it can also increase the shelf life of fresh food uh, and reduce food waste. It's really positive. Kuntec is headed by Dr. Kate Murray-Green. And I mention this because one of the biggest mountains the sector needs to climb is attracting more female talent. We need to inspire females at a young age and show them that, much like politics, science uh, isn't the male-dominated sector that it used to be uh, and shouldn't be. Dr. Barbara Blaney at BioCity 
works hard to bring local schools into the site. Uh, and seeing an important and successful scientists in this environment will, I hope, uh, work uh, to encourage the growth of female uh, graduates. We also need to attract talent from children from disadvantaged backgrounds. This group is underrepresented in the sector. Yes? Ian Gray. Perhaps the member uh, will give me the opportunity to correct Maureen Watt's misunderstanding of the point I made at the end of my speech that what we should be doing is articulating articulating the potential for things like finding a cure for MS or MND, work which is already ongoing, rather than simply talking about economic growth, <coughs> exactly to inspire those young women who we need to see enter this industry. Graham Simpson. Thank you, and I, uh, I have to say to Mr. Gray, I did found it, I found his uh, earlier contribution uh, quite upbeat, in fact. Um, now, one way to support some uh, aspiring young scientists would be to increase life sciences uh, apprenticeships. Um, on a recent visit to New College Lanarkshire, I was told that there are only 62 life sciences apprentices across the whole of Scotland. 62, that's clearly not good enough. Apprenticeships are a fantastic way to train up the next generation of scientists. We need to build on current network networks between academia and industry to increase this number. So one of my questions to the government is what can be done about this? And if the, uh, if the minister doesn't have an answer today, I would urge him not to make one up, but to go away uh, and think it through. Um, presiding officer, there have been some excellent contributions to the debate today. Let me just fly through them. Uh, Dean Lockhart spoke about the need for UK uh, collaboration. He also mentioned the skills gap. Richard Leonard, uh, spoke of a need for uh, a trade deal with the EU, uh, called for more joint working. Willie Rennie mentioned somebody called Bob, who is uh, bored of Brexit, uh, and then uh, banged on about Brexit. Uh, Ruth Maguire um, spoke about the jobs in uh, her constituency uh, and mentioned uh, a smart house she'd visited. Um, I've also got a smart house uh, in East Kilbride at South Lanarkshire College. Gordon Lindhurst um, spoke about governments working together. Uh, Kenny Gibson, who actually used to work in the sector, um, spoke about the work of the CPG that I've mentioned, uh, and also skills and uh, getting women into science, which I've already touched on. Um, the upbeat uh, Ian Gray, um, he spoke about international competition uh, and the lack of uh, science teachers. Shona Robeson and Bill Bowman, uh, both mentioned uh, the life sciences sector in Dundee, which is doing really well. Uh, Maureen Watt uh, appeared to forget which debate she was in uh, before uh, she did get onto life sciences and talked about the uh, Northeast. Um, so why is this sector uh, so successful? We've got over 700 companies operating here and the highest number of life sciences startups per capita in the UK. And these companies support over 37,000 jobs uh, in the sector. Um, I'm going to stick to time, presiding officer, because I know you like that, so I'll chop a, a whole bit out. Um, <laughs> I'm very, really, really very sorry. But I did take an intervention from Mr. Gray. Um, the life sciences strategy sets an ambition to grow the sector by 7% per year to reach turnover of £8 billion by 2025. Is that ambitious enough? Forecast. Uh, annual increases of 6% in R&D spending by the pharmaceutical industry on its own could meet that target. So that's a question uh, for the government. It costs staggering sums to bring a new medicine to market, but medicines keep people out of hospital. So is the government being is serious about NHS Scotland being a partner in delivering uh, their strategy? Where can we scrutinise the figures that illustra illustrate the life sciences target is on target, and do NHS boards still have a network of innovation champions, and what m m matrix are being used to allow the N NHS to demonstrate it's working? I apologize for going over time, presiding officer, and I will sit down. Thank you. Apologies are always welcome. <laughs> uh, and I would call uh, Ivan McKee uh, to close the debate. Uh, Around nine minutes, we'll see as nicely to decision time, please, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And um, yeah, it's been a very um, 
um, informative, interesting, and at times entertaining debate. Um, apologies in advance if I don't touch on everyone's contribution. There was uh, quite a number of uh, areas to touch on. I'll try and focus on the most, uh, most critical. I think the first thing I'd like to talk about is um, clear up some issues around about uh, uh, the, U the Scottish Government's attitude to the UK Government um, and cooperation in this, in this sector. Um, and I think it's, it's clear to say, and for the record, we're very keen to work with uh, the UK Government in terms of securing funding. Um, I, uh, w w the industry leadership group recognises that the huge value of the funding that's available there through the industrial strategy. Uh, and I continue to advise organisations to, uh, to put together collaborations and, and, and apply for money. We've clearly been successful in terms of the money that's come forward for the MMIC, uh, significant money into James Hutton um, and I care that I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. So there's, 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 and there are many, many others. Um, I have. Um, met with uh, Ian Campbell, Head of Innovate UK, on two separate occasions in my brief six months in, in office. And uh, both those occasions, the, the conversation centred largely around the life science sector and what uh, Scotland could get from, uh, from UK government opportunities in that sector. And I'm um, uh, on first name terms with my UK government counterpart, uh, Lord uh, Henley, Oliver. Um, and we've met several times to talk about um, the cooperation. And, and indeed, uh, Oliver was at the, 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 the most recent ILG meeting that, uh, that we held here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and we do that not least because it's our money. Scotland pays our taxes, it goes to Westminster, and the UK government uses that money to fund all manner of things, including the industrial strategy, and it's only right and fair that we should get our fair, fair share of that and we continue to push that. One thing I would ask that maybe... Um, sure. Graham Simpson. I'm, I'm encouraged to uh, hear that. I wonder if the, the minister and his friend Oliver might like to uh, come along together to the uh, CPG on life sciences at some point. Ivan McKee. I think you need to uh, you need to ask Oliver that question, um, but uh, I think there's, there's one important point here. Um, I've written to UK government twice now to ask for Scottish representation on both the UK Life Science Council and the um, Life Science Industrial Strategy Implementation Board. Uh, and that hasn't happened yet. So if the, the members opposite were able to add some weight to that appeal, that would be hugely, um, hugely uh, um, beneficial and appreciate, uh, appreciate them doing that. Um, I turn to the, uh, the contribution from, uh, from the Labour bench. I mean, this is the strategy. Um, and I know we keep talking about we need a strategy. We've, we've got a strategy. I think constructive comments on what else could be in the strategy would be very welcome. But uh, continuing to par out we need a strategy when there's one line in front of us uh, isn't, uh, isn't essentially very, uh, very helpful. Um, the key point about the strategy, I think the two things that Richard uh, Leonard said were wrong with it was, uh, was that... Um, one that uh, didn't include the trade unions, and I take that point on board, and that's something um, well, I, I shall take up as, uh, as, as an action going forward. And that had a picture of Dave Tudor in it, um, and I'm sure now Dave's uh, left ILG to do something else. You can maybe take his picture. I don't know if that will make you make you happy, and then you can sign up to the sign up to the strategy that's been developed bottom up by the sector, which I think is far more effective than government sitting um, in an ivory tower and pushing something down onto the sector. That's why it works, that's why it's robust, and that's why it is, uh, it's delivering, delivering results. Yeah, sure. Richard Leonard. Yeah, I'm, I'm not calling for the displacement of industry. I'm calling for uh, a broader approach, which includes the trade unions, but which is government-led, because in the end, uh, individual companies will represent individual company interests. There needs to be a broader view led by government. Ivan McKee. I think he misunderstands the purpose of the ILG. It is led by uh, the government, a, a huge role to play in that. Uh, agencies are all there and it works in collaboration with industry because industry has, across all sectors, at the parts of the sector, including small companies, big companies, and if, you, if you're at one of the meetings, you would understand the way that that collaboration works very, very strongly, including the NHS, universities, and many other, many other very relevant, relevant stakeholders. Um, moving on, um, some very interesting points from uh, Graham Simpson. Gender balance, I take on board, and that's something we continue to push for. Apprenticeships, I shall go and investigate. That. I'll be very surprised if that's the number, given the tens of thousands of apprenticeships that the government is supporting. But we shall, uh, I shall go and look at that and get back to you. And uh, in regards to the NHS, that's something that I've, uh, I've, I've commented on and, and will comment on again, because I think that relationship is absolutely key and central to, uh, to driving, driving the sector forward. Ian Gray's uh, contribution, I found extremely thoughtful 
um, and, uh, and helpful. Um, I recognise that uh, there's, uh, there, there are cities out there. I visited Zurich recently and I visited others where life sciences is very core to what they're doing. We should learn from them, uh, watch uh, and do our, do our very, very best. And it's great to hear Pete Downs talking about collaboration universities um, because of their nature um, can often be more competitive than collaborative. But Pete, uh, from my conversations with him uh, and, 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 and with yourself, clearly understands, uh, as do many others, that uh, universities working together is, uh, with other states stakeholders is the, is the way forward. And in terms of the startups, there's been 170 startups in the sector um, over the six year period to 2015. Uh, and on top of that, 60 university spin outs. So we are continuing to fill the pipeline. Perhaps we can do better, but we are continuing to push that with some results. Ian Green. The was that the pipeline has to support companies, medium sized companies, as they grow big, as an alternative to uh, selling out to uh, overseas investors. Ivan McKee. Yeah, I mean, there is always a balance between bringing in uh, foreign direct investment, which is usually uh, critical to the economy, and, and, and growing the, the, the businesses as fast as we can through whatever investment is available. But I do take, uh, take the point on board. Moving on to uh, cover the, the points that Willie Rennie made, and, and I think it's hugely important. I said I would come back to uh, Brexit, and it's um, to communicate the sector's concerns about the impending developments around Brexit. Uh, and while businesses across many sectors are concerned about the damage Brexit will do, the life science sector stands to be particularly impacted uh, because as well as exacerbating skill shortages, disrupting complex international supply chains, the risk of relative divergence is a particular concern to the life science sector. The close relationship between the sector and academia means that the risk to research funds, to cooperation and free flow of academic talent will also significantly harm the sector. And life sciences businesses, I can tell you, never miss an opportunity to remind me of the damage Brexit will do to their ability to trade. Yesterday, I met with Merck and they expressed concerns about the risk to their supply chain going forward. And in my visit to Canon Medical this morning, um, I found out that more than 30% of the firm's employees working on artificial intelligence are EU nationals. Highly skilled, highly mobile and critical to the business success in Scotland, but hugely concerned about their, about their future. Presiding officer, in the opening I highlighted the long history Scotland has in life sciences, our long-standing and ongoing global academic excellence in medical research and technology, the breadth and range of our life science businesses and the ambitious plans the sector has for growth in turnover and in exports going forward. In November, I had the privilege of speaking at the largest ever Scottish Life Science Conference in Scotland, a community of hundreds of companies, academics and NHS representatives got together to consider the future of the sector and celebrate what has been achieved through the development of a strong life science community in Scotland. Life sciences is one of the many sectors where Scotland demonstrates true global excellence and the potential to continue to excel. The challenges facing the sector I've covered. Those in our control, including skills and investment, have detailed the work this government is doing to support the sector. And those like the mistake that is Brexit, where we have to do our best to mitigate the misguided policies of others. I've made clear our determination, working with my colleagues, the Cabinet Secretary and Minister for Health, to ensure the contribution that our Scottish NHS can play to develop the sector is maximised, taking all due care and attention to ensure parent patient care is uh, paramount and data protection is sacrosanct. The two-way street that enables our NHS to access the best technology and innovations to apply them to the benefit of patients, driving up safety and driving down waiting times and costs. The ability of the sector to take the best innovations of our clinicians and other health service workers and to commercialise and apply them globally, benefiting Scotland's economy and jobs, our public sector finances and patients, not just in Scotland, round about the world. Because the life science sector is more than just another industrial sector in Scotland's range of world-class industries. The work the businesses do is truly life-saving, literally saving lives through innovation, healthier and wealthier. That's what makes it such a key part of Scotland's economic strategy. We are proud to be standing on the shoulders of giants, Lister, Fleming, and of course, Dolly the Sheep. And I'm proud to be working with an excellent team in the industry leadership group and across the wider sector and I shall continue to work with them to drive forward plans to grow the sector, to maximise its potential, to contribute to Scotland's economy and wider society going forward. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on recognising the life sciences sector. The next item is consideration of business motion 15280 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. And could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Thank you very much. And no one wishes to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 15280 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. We turn now to decision time. And the first question today is that amendment 15261.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend motion 15261 in the name of Ivan McKee on recognising the life sciences sector in Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 15261.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart is yes, 29, no, 92. There are no abstentions and the motion is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 15261.2 in the name of Richard Leonard, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Ivan McKee, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 15261 in the name of Ivan McKee as amended on recognising the life sciences sector in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members business in the name of Gordon MacDonald on the Rotary Club of Balerno, or Curly Balerno recycling PCs. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.